We're beginning our week 20 lecture on double object pronouns. We'll begin by reviewing for the quiz. If you were asked, Qu'est-ce que tu bois quand tu as soif? Qu'est-ce que tu bois quand tu as soif? You had to answer in a complete sentence. How would you begin? Quand j'ai soif, je bois. Last week we had a couple of examples of what you would drink when you are thirsty. This week we have a few more. You've got de l'eau minérale. And there are some French mineral and sparkling waters there. Um, remember that you need the partitive article for whatever you will be um, saying that you drink. And then another uh, beverage could be du café glacé would be iced coffee. What is the difference? We'll see whenever we get to our vocabulary review, but also we see it here. Whenever there is an accented E with glacé, that's iced. Glass is ice in the same way that our past participles with the uh, accented E add that ED is the same with this. So it's iced coffee. And then to review our vocabulary from last week. Um, if you said faire les courses or des courses, then uh, you would be correct. And how would we say, let's go shopping? And the hint for this is you would be using the imperative conjugation of the present tense. So if this is the present tense and we want to say let's, remember with imperative, it's either an understood and familiar singular you, understood you plural or formal, or once I am included and it's let us, then it would be nous. So faisons du cours. Faisons is the uh, first person plural uh, conjugation of the verb faire. So whatever your verb is, then you would conjugate it to agree with whatever you're trying to say. If someone was telling you to go do the shopping, then it would be fait des courses. Uh, um, uh, you or the group of you. Okay, uh, next. If you said jouer au bowling, you are correct. And how would we say, let's go bowling? Our verb here is jouer, so we would conjugate it to agree with uh, nous. So, jouons au bowling. Let's go bowling. Next one. If you said faire du cheval, that's correct. And again, how would we say let's go horseback riding? Faisons du cheval. Correct. Okay, finally very popular weekend or vacation getaway is the country or countryside. Aller a la campagne. Let's go to, or excuse me, to go to the countryside. And then to say, let's go to the country. Allons a la campagne. Oh, sorry, there were a couple more of these. Uh, ice skating. This is actually the Devon ice skating rink. Oklahoma City, if you've been there before, I have not. Uh, faire du patin à glace, and you can see here the difference. This is just glass, so it's just ice. Whereas in the example before, it was iced. So faire du patin à glace, to go ice skating. Let's go ice skating, faisons du patin à glace. All right, and then faire du vélo, Faisons du vélo. Review your vocabulary. Remember uh, that your verb there is what you would conjugate to agree with whatever was, you know, asked of you or required. So now to review our pronouns i ou on. And if you remember, when we use on and when we use i or y, on is for the preposition de, any form of de except with people. 
Uh, it could also be expressions of quantity, which would be those partitive articles, um, de, um, du, de la, just like we um, mentioned earlier with the beverages, but uh, it could also be like beaucoup de, a lot of, trop de, too much of, um, peu de, a little bit of, or like pas de, so it could also be um, with those. So um, just be on the lookout, but this would be about de, and either places or things, uh, we'll see in some examples. E would take the place of um, prepositions, generally your prepositions like en, chez, dans, um, like those, like not de, and also a ah, expressions. So those would be places or things. So let's look at some examples. Elle n'est pas sortie du travail à 5 heures. She did not leave work at 5 o'clock. Now, if we want to say she did not leave there at 5 o'clock, then we want to replace du travail. Um, so then it would just be to recognize, okay, we have e in sorti. Is this functioning as two verbs or is it passé composé, which would have the helping verb and the past participle? And in this case, it is the passé composé. And so, en would take the place of du travail and that would come before the helping verb. So, elle non n'est pas sorti à 5 heures. She did not leave there at five o'clock. All right, the next sentence. Je ne vais pas en France cette année. I am not going to France this year. So in this case, uh, we want to replace, we, we would want to say, I'm not going there this year. So that would be replacing en France. Don't get confused with en, the pronoun, because that's just what we're using to replace any you know, little prepositional phrase, or, you know, the ones with de and stuff like that. Whereas in this case, en France is just a preposition, so we would be using e, or the y. So, je n'y vais pas cette année. I'm not going there this year. See the difference there? If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Okay? Va-tu répondre à l'invitation? Va-tu répondre à l'invitation? Are you going to answer or reply to the invitation? In this case, we want to say, are you going to reply to it? So we're replacing à l'invitation. And because we've got à, that lets us know that we need to use i. So va-tu y répondre? Va-tu y répondre? In this case, this is a question, but it's also got two verbs. And even though we've inverted that subject and verb, um, the e would still come before the infinitive or the second verb. Well, generally it's the second, but let's say it's the infinitive, okay? N'as-tu pas de stylo? N'as-tu pas de stylo? Okay, in this case, so don't you have two pencils, pens, sorry. Don't you have two pens? In this case, we uh, wanna say, don't you have two of them? So we're replacing stilo, and because this is a quantity, then we would say, non, n'as-tu pas deux? Don't you have two of them? So we're still keeping the quantity two, but we're just replacing the noun with the pronoun on. Okay, one more example. Mange des légumes. Mange des légumes. Eat the vegetables, eat some vegetables. So if we wanna say eat them, we're replacing the des légumes, and because it's a quantity of something, we've got de there, then it's mange on. And this is the only time that the pronoun comes after
after the verb or in any other place except before is whenever um, it's the affirmative command form. Okay, next up is our video. Uh, again, I think it's kind of silly a little bit to play a video of a video. So I'm going to let you guys uh, go through this again and watch it yourself. But I will also have some, I'm gonna have some uh, comprehension questions because the answer from too many of you was that you didn't go back to watch it. So that's what we're gonna do for this. Okay, let me see if I can get ahead of that. Okay, uh, our famous place, oh, okay, I skipped straight past it. Okay, uh, our place to go or, you know, our notable place this week is Corsica. Uh, because of its proximity sar to Sardinia, uh, I think, which is an Italian island, um, Corsica is, in one of their languages is, uh, as we see here, so they, it is actually a French um, property or um, department. It was annexed to France in 1768. It actually never really belonged to what we would call Italy. Um, but if you'd like to go down the rabbit hole of some history, European history, it was pretty interesting. But for our purposes, it is part of France and has been for quite a while. Um, official language is French, but also, uh, and in some schools still, Corsu is taught, which is a Corsican language. And though it comes from Latin, just like French and Italian, Portuguese and English, it is uh, very similar to Italian, probably more than um, French, but, uh, so there's that. It is um, known for being the birthplace of, well, one of the things it's known for is being the birthplace of Napoleon. He was born in the capital city. Um, he lived there like a while. He kind of had a tumultuous, uh, you know, growing up, well, I guess his whole life was, but anyway, um, he left there and then like after he was, you know, I guess teenager or something, he never went back and political stuff. Um, is also known for being um, the birthplace of what was original, like the Vemarani was the original Coca Cola back in the day when it was okay to have things like alcohol or like wine and cocaine in your beverages. Um, but I guess, you know, when you know better, do better. Uh, I guess because it made people feel so great and it was. Uh, it was hugely popular, like exported out of Corsica and out of France to the United States. And you had everyone from like presidents and religious leaders, everybody was saying, oh, this stuff is so great. You should get some, drink it three times a day for its health benefits and stuff. And then whenever they started putting, um, whenever the government required ingredients on the list, they were like, oh, well, I guess you can't have alcohol, you know, it was during that time too, prohibition, whatever. So they couldn't have served uh, the wine with it or whatever. And so you replaced it with like sugar, essential oils and citric acid. And then that's what actually became Coca-Cola. Um, as opposed to coming from the coca plant that is, I guess used to also make cocaine. But anyway, um, there are, uh, lots of, it's a very mountainous island. Um, being an island, it does have lots of beaches. Uh, it's more like people would go there more to camp than to be like, to go to those, you know, high-end resorts, although they do have uh, Porto, let's see, Porto Vecchio, um, which is, you know, pretty elite, but generally if you're, you know, looking at the differences between Corsica and Sardinia, Sardinia is much more like tourist area, lots and lots of, you know, it's its own interesting island, but Corsica is just kind of like preserved natural beauty a little bit more, a little bit more like nature and um, like the beautiful, what is it, like flowers and stuff like that, just because it grows in abundance, it just has like, you know, great scent as you're, uh, I guess, hiking through there, some different things like that. But it's pretty beautiful. Here are some other pictures. Um, so you see mountains in the background, you've got beach, it's beautiful. You can see the perspective of like the people on the beach. They've got the like really light sand and the water is like turquoise and actually super clear. 
I kind of lost track of, there was one picture that I saw that was amazing. I kept trying to say, oh, is there one better? But um, yeah, it's not that I would go in there just because I could see, because then it just makes it easier to see like the fish and the stuff like that, that might be, you know, eating your feet, but, or ankles, gross. Um, but it just seems like a beautiful place, uh, even though it has sand. Um, here are some of those flowers that I was telling you about. You see some of the areas are more like rocky coastline and stuff, but they also have sandy beaches. Um, again, just so beautiful and just thought that was cool. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, if you'd like to learn more about Corsica, quick little search. Okay, and so then that brings us to our notable French person for this week, who would be Napoleon Bonaparte. How could we get like four or five weeks in, not talk about him, but here we are. Um, he was born in 1769, which was the year after Corsica was annexed to France, um, to 1821. But so he's considered one of the greatest military figures ever. Uh, he became a military officer when he was 16 years old. He went to like he was when his family moved or fled Corsica, came to France. He went to like military school, so he was an officer at 16. Became a brigadier general at 24. I mean, he really like promoted quickly. Uh, he was very ambitious. Um, he, as he was like, you know, taking care of, taking over everything, he uh, came in like towards the end of the Russian, Re excuse me, I was just looking at Russia, um, the French Revolution, um, went ahead and took over in a coup d'etat. Like at that time, he just decided, yes, I am the emperor or it was consort or something. Anyway, so he took over, uh, being very young still. Um, and he expanded the French empire throughout Europe and on and on. Um, kind of read part of the story about how they were in Egypt and then he decided, you know what, never mind. He left his soldiers in Egypt, just like, okay, bye. Um, so as everybody was, you know, trying to get colonies all over the world, kicking out the people that were actually living there. But anyway, um, he decided that he was like losing interest in building up an empire in North America and decided that he could sell the, what would end up being called Louisiana Purchase. Um, he was just like, yeah, here, take the whole thing for $15 million, um, which was more than the US president said was okay to spend, but they were like, hey, here's a good deal on, you know, a big chunk of the country, so they went for it. Um, and he also needed money for more wars, so, or he wanted more money for more wars. Uh, when he, you know, as he's like going out, taking over everything or has like allies of the countries in between where he was taking over, um, he lost to Russia this couple of years, you know, summarizing lots of stuff in just a couple of like sentences, but, um, he lost to Russia. He abdicated in like 1814, I think, uh, was exiled to the island of Elba, which is kind of off, what is it, like in the Mediterranean Sea? off the coast, not too, not so, so far away, but yeah, far enough away. Um, and then decided, yeah, so never mind, I'm gonna go back because it didn't work out with reinstating the king. Um, and so then though, whenever he went to Waterloo, really like lost bad there, abdicated again. This time the British were like, okay, well, whatever, you're not gonna keep doing this. They sent him to St. Helena, an island way off the coast of Africa in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, like 2,000 miles away from land or whatever, um, where he lived from 1815 to his death. Uh, it was weird that they built him a house in like 1817. I don't know. Okay. Um, anyway, so this is where we get the term Napoleon complex of, you know, people who are short but feel like they have to be very like aggressively competitive in the best of everything. But they were just like, why do they say he was so short? Maybe he was surrounded by taller soldiers but he was like the out like five six was pretty average for there or for them um okay so here's a little joke to break up the monotony uh deux voisins discute j'ai déguisé mon chien et chat pour halloween et ça c'est bien passé pas vraiment maintenant il ne vient plus jamais quand je l'appelle cute okay so two cousins discussing. I disguised or dressed up my dog as a cat for Halloween. And how did that work out? And what happened with that? Or did it work and did that work out well? Not really. Uh, now he doesn't, he never comes anymore whenever I call him. 
I guess if you're a cat person, you get it, but maybe dog people do too. So, okay, so here are some of our new vocabulary um, words, or you know, the theme is health and hygiene. So we've got uh, la santé, which is health. So la bonne santé would be in good health. Être en forme would be to be fit. Um, which usually they'll also ask, you know, like, it's kind of like in the Sava, like, um, is that on forme? Like, is everything good? Um, les vitamines, les pansements, because what kid doesn't love band-aids? Um, les aspirines, le savon, uh, French soap is great. Like, actually, um, I don't know, another one of their, like, well-known things are soap from Marseille, which makes it extra special. Um, les mouchoirs en papier is pretty fun. It's tissue, but it literally means paper handkerchief. I don't know. Uh, okay, so that's our new vocabulary. There's plenty more, but there's just a few to get an idea. Okay, starting our review of our direct object pronouns. So those are me, te, le, la, nous, vous, and les. And you remember that the direct object receives the action of the verb. So it's only an action verb, sentences that will have a direct object. So Marie adore les feux d'artifice. Marie loves um, fireworks. Okay, so Marie is your subject. What does Marie do in this sentence? She adore, she loves. What does she love? Les feux d'artifice, fireworks. Okay, so les feux d'artifice is our direct object. Uh, it is plural, as the les tells you. So that's so helpful that the correct, you know, the equivalent um, pronoun would be les. And so, and our direct object pronoun comes before the verb. So Marie les adore. Marie loves them. Okay. Jean va chercher sa mère. Jean uh, is our subject. Va chercher. So here we have two verbs. Um, I'm sure you recognize right away that this is a two verb scenario and not passé composé that has a helping verb and a past participle. So Jean is going to look for sa mère, his mom. Who is he going to look for? his mom. That is the direct object of this sentence. So, sa mère is a feminine singular noun. So, la is going to replace it. Our third person feminine right there, uh, pronoun, is going to replace sa mère. And again, it goes, um, just as we've you know said before, when you have two verbs, the direct object pronoun goes before the infinitive verb. So Jean va la chercher. Jean is going to look for her. Okay. Sylvie a étudié la géographie. Sylvie studied geography. Okay. So la géographie is a feminine singular noun. We have a étudié, which is passé composé using avoir when we put our direct object pronoun, which will be la, before the verb, in this passé composé using avoir, then remember that the past participle agrees with the direct object pronoun. So, Sylvie studied geography, Sylvie studied it, Sylvie l'a étudié. So we had to add an E to agree with la géographie because it's the passé composé using avoir and the direct object pronoun preceded it, so it came before. Okay, moving on to reviewing um, indirect object pronouns. Me, te, lui, nous, vous, leur. So indirect objects are going to be referring back to like people or people like things. So, um, so we've got to me, to you, to him or her, to us, to you, or the group of you, or you formally, or to them would be leur. 
So in our first sentence, Maman, j'ai faim. Tu fais un hamburger à moi? Mom, I'm hungry. Will you make a hamburger for me? Or can you make a hamburger for me? Um, à moi is to me. It's just the stress pronoun moi. Um, one way to ask that would be tu me fais un hamburger? Tu me fais, you make me a hamburger. If you wanted to practice a little bit with imperative, make sure that you're still being polite or mom is not making that hamburger for you. Fais-moi un hamburger, s'il vous plaît. Make me a hamburger, please. So in the imperative, or if it comes at the end of the sentence, then it becomes moi. Um, when it precedes the verb, then it's m or m apostrophe if it comes before a vowel. Okay. Uh, yes, remembering that the purpose of the indirect object is to receive the action of the direct object. So, tu vas parler au vendeur. Are you going to talk to the salesman? And you want to say, are you going to talk to him? Him or her would be lui. So, tu vas lui parler. When we have two verbs, then the pronoun comes before the infinitive. It is helpful that these are consistent, whether it's direct object pronoun, indirect object pronoun, um, or the e in all. Okay? J'ai acheté un cadeau à toi. J'ai acheté un cadeau à toi. I bought a gift for you. In this case, this is passé composé. We have the avoir helping verb. Acheté is the um, past participle. So I bought, there's our subject and verb, un cadeau is the direct object. What did I buy? I bought a gift. And then who is the gift for? A toi, for you. So we're going to, this toi is going to be te. And then remember, it's going to come before the helping verb in the passé composé. Je t'ai acheté un cadeau. In this case, remember that it is not the indirect object pronoun that precedes the helping verb um, in the passé composé using avoir. It, that has to agree with the past participle. It's only the direct object pronoun. So, je t'ai acheté. I bought for you a gift. Okay, so now that we've gone over those two and then we previously reviewed e and en, we're going to move on to what to do whenever we have two pronouns. So we've got a direct and indirect object placement. We'll start with those two. Elle me donne la brosse. We already have one um, of the pronouns before the verb because you already know how to do that, right? Elle me donne. She gives me the brush. So when we have this case, then elle me la donne. She gives it to me. In English, that order is completely different, but this is the way that it goes, that me, then la, okay? Je t'apporte le savon. I bring you, or I carry to you, the soap. And we already have the T preceding it. So with our le savon, then it becomes je te l'apporte. I am bringing it to you. So the rule here is me, te, nous, and vous come before le, la, le, before the verb. So any of these four, if you have me, te, nous, or vous, it's going to come before a le, la, or le, and then those both will come before the verb. Okay, let's use, let's look at lui and leur. Marie lui donne le peigne. Marie gives him the comb. So him, to him, is the direct object pronoun there, the, excuse me, indirect object. It goes to him, and then what is being given is the comb, le peigne, okay? Marie le lui donne. So there the direct object pronoun precedes the indirect object pronoun. Nous leur disons la vérité. We tell them the truth. Here the indirect object pronoun is leur for them, and la vérité is the direct object pronoun is the direct object. 
Nous la leur disons. Again, direct object pronoun precedes le here, the indirect object pronoun, because le, la, and le will come before lui and leur, before the verb. So we just have two 